Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Podcast party people. It's not much of a party today. That's right. Unfortunately, it's not much of a party today. But I will do my best to celebrate the life of Joey. Joey. I can't say it. Joey Jordison. I got a. I got a. I got a confession to make. For the last, I don't know how many years, I thought his name was Jordanson. I did not notice that there was not an N in his name. Jordison. So I always said Joey Jordanson. And somebody pointed out today, oh, you spelled his name wrong on Twitter. Because I put up a picture today. And uh, I was like, motherfucker. <laughs> I was like, how did I get that wrong? You know, it's not like I went around saying his last name all the time. So I'm going to do my best to uh, share some of my good memories of Joey Jordison. And, uh, you know, I'm always a little loath to do these things because sometimes people read shit into them and they're like, oh, you know, he dissed him or he said something bad. And, you know, like fucking people get so fucking uptight about it, you know, at, right after someone passes away and uh i'm just gonna try and do my best to i'm just gonna share some funny fucking stories man because our lives were surprisingly intertwined quite a bit um first thing though i gotta play i gotta play this for you this has got to be one of my funniest fucking memories so i'm gonna play for you where is this i'm gonna play for you so let me set the scene for you. So the scene is the Roadrunner United concert, which I don't know how many people have seen. But it's a long concert, two hours. It's fucking wild and a million people, and it goes off really well. And then for the last song, everybody joins in on stage, and we all jam Roots, Bloody Roots by Sepultura. With Andreas is up there, Joey Jordanson on drums, Paul Gray, Adam Deuce on bass. Everybody, everybody's, and I just get up there and I'm singing. I'm not playing guitar for some reason. I don't know why, because I know this song like the back of my hand. Anyway, we're playing, and I'm I'm up on the drum riser rocking out with Joey during this song. We, I do, like, the last half of the song just up on the drum riser, and it's fucking crazy. There's so many people on stage. <laughs> I wish I could show this to you. I don't know if I can show it to you. Maybe I can send the clip over to my guy, and he can edit it in. But, uh... We get to this one part. We, it gets to the part. It's like da, 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 the little thing, lead thing at the end. It gets to that part, and then you know the next riff comes in, and Joey stands up and he goes, "Hey, let me get the microphone real quick." And I saw him up there, so I hand him my microphone, and then this is what he says. My vocal debut. To the guy that made this all possible and fucking killed us while doing it. Fuck Monty Connor. <laughs> Fuck Monty Connor. Fuck Monty Connor. Yeah, Fuck, Fuck Monty, Monty Connor. Connor. Fuck Monty Connor. And it's all to the riff. Fuck Monty <laughs> Connor. Fuck. Uh, I was fucking in tears when he was doing that. It's so fucking funny. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Too fucking funny. No one was expecting this. This is totally, you know, he might have planned this out, but this was completely unscripted, completely spontaneous, at least to all of us. We had no idea he was going to do it, so it was so goddamn funny. And for the rest of the night, of course, everybody who walks up to Monty Connor just goes, fuck Monty Connor, fuck Monty Connor at the Roadrunner United thing. Oh, it was fucking great. There at the PlayStation Theater in New York City. Yeah, it was a good vibe. It was a good vibe, but that has got to be one of my funniest live on stage 
moments right there. That right there. The fuck Monty Connor chant <laughs> at the Roadrunner United show. New York fucking back in, Jesus, what was that, 2005 or something? Fuck. 2006? 2000, I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea. Anyway. I, uh, let me take you back to the beginning. I met Joey Jordanson. Uh, I want to say it was 1998. It was either November 1998 or it was beginning of the year 1999. But I remember the weather was amazing. We were in L.A. We are in Malibu. And, you know, North, November, it must have been November because the weather was still really nice and it stays nice down there until, like, November, December. Then January comes and everything kind of goes to shit most of the time. But, uh... Machine Head were finishing recording the Burning Red with Ross Robinson, and Slipknot had just signed to Ross Robinson's brand new record label through Roadrunner called I Am Recordings, and he brought them in, and I think we might have gone a couple of days over, as we <clears throat> tend to do sometimes, and uh, so we overlapped, and we ended up living at the studio with... The Slipknot guys. So we're at Malibu. We're at uh, Indigo Ranch recording studio in Malibu. And uh, and so we just kind of ended up, we still had, there There was like a separate house there where bands lived. A spider web and spider infested house where bands stayed. And uh, I think those guys all slept in the actual uh, like lounge area of the studio. And so the whole band was there. And this was before... Jim Root was in the band. I want to say this was like when they had their original guitar player, like whose name escapes me. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe, but I don't recall Jim Root being there, at least initially. And, uh, you know, it was Mick and Joey and Sean and Corey and and uh, Craig was there and Chris Fain and Paul. And uh, I remember we kind of hit it off. I don't, I don't know why, but we kind of just, you know, Chris Fain and Paul were very social and funny and so we ended up playing like basketball like we'd play like horse there's a basketball hoop we'd play basketball with those guys and uh but you know it became pretty pretty clear to me early on that joey and sean kind of you know they were kind of the bosses of the band you know like joey in particular definitely like when it came to the music like it was him and uh you know they were around so they were just around. So we're still working on, I can't remember if we were recording stuff. I know we, I was doing vocals still for sure. I can't remember if we were recording music or guitars or what we were doing, but they, everybody was, all, both bands were still around. And, uh, you know, we started talking to, to all the guys and, uh, you know, Joey was a big violence fan. He was really into my former band violence. I think, I think he liked violence more than he liked machine head. <laughs> If I was to be straight with you, because all he wanted to talk about was violence, and uh, so we talk, so we'd talk about violence, and uh, and then I remember at some point I was doing the vocals for um, "Nothing Left," the song, which is the second song on the Burning Red, and I do this big this there's this breakdown in the middle where there's this long build up and then it comes in, and. Ross kept on having me do like take he's like you got to be more intense you got to you just got to go fucking crazier on this part and so uh on one of the takes I like you know I I guess this is the take where Ross was like yeah I think this is it and him and Joey were in, there. in fact I think a lot of the band was in the room while I was tracking vocals because like every time I'd go to talk back to Ross it was like a party was going on in the background like it <laughs> Like laughing and you know like he's trying to talk to me on the talk back i'm in the vocal booth so i'm just like dude i can't hear anything and so anyway they're in there and uh and i start doing that vocal build up and then next thing i know i get to the part where it kicks in and him and joey burst into the vocal booth they're like ah, they come on they start shoving me around they start they start a mosh pit 
in the vocal booth, like, fucking, we got nothing left for nobody else, and they're fucking slamming into me and all this stuff, and then they just start screaming, so I got nothing left for nobody else, I got nothing left for nobody, ah, nothing left for nobody else, I got nothing left for nobody, ah, and that ah that you hear is him and J- Ross and Joey screaming in the background, and it was just such a wild fucking rad take that, uh, I was just like, fuck, we got to keep that. That's amazing. You know, like, I wish I would have thought of that. And it was funny because it was just like this, you know, maybe they planned it. But to me, it was totally, I mean, it totally caught me off guard and was, you know, just this amazing, spontaneous experience that is there on the burning red for the rest of time. So Joey Jordanson, you know, within one of the first days that we're, we meet him, like he ends up on fucking a machine head record in the, on the vocals. And, uh. You know, we ended up, uh, he was very, um, you know, I think with the with the other guys, I ended up kind of, we ended up going into town, we kind of went into Hollywood sometimes, went and caught a couple of shows. Um, maybe Jim Root was there. I remember going to catch a couple of shows with Jim Root, or maybe it was like the second time around or something, I can't remember. But, uh, but he was very serious, man. Like, really really fucking serious like serious about the drums music wanted them to play good he was uh stone cold sober stone cold fucking sober and i was kind of like at this point i was i had just done a bunch of therapy i had kind of changed my you know i'd gone through this very very self-destructive phase at the end of more things change and you know i I had uh, kind of gone from fighting the world to fighting myself. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of in this, like, zen. You know, I'm hanging out in fucking Southern California. It's all, like, hippy-dippy bullshit everywhere. And I'm like, okay. And so that was kind of my state of mind. But, but at the same time, I was having a lot of trouble at adjusting to who I was and what this new person was and, in doing so I kind of slipped back into some of my old addictions and you know I started doing a lot of coke and you know I'm in fucking LA it was just cocaine mania and uh you know so I was kind of I was kind of a mess here he is stone cold sober and I'm looking at him just like you know I'm trying to get him to party like let's party fucking I want to party with everybody and he was like no like this is fucking way too serious man like I was like really you know I saw a lot of myself in that because when I did burn my eyes, it was the same thing. Like, I was stone cold sober for the whole thing, like, stem to stern. And, you know, there was there was a part of me that kind of, you know, in a, in a way, it kind of put me in check. I was just like, yeah, like, what am I doing? Like, I'm, I'm fucking partying too much. You know, like, I'm, I'm fucking up. Like, what am I doing? Like, look at this fucking, this fucking kid is fucking hungry as shit, you know, and here I am kind of wasting time fucking trying to fuck around in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, just like we had a couple of, we had a couple of talks when I was trying to get, when I was partying, trying to get him to party. And he was just explaining to me like why he was not drinking and, and, uh, and, you know, it kind of, it had an effect on me and I kind of got my shit together after this. So the recording ends you know, there's a bunch of other stories there. Like, you know, we hung out with Mick. Mick helped me work on my guitar one time. I, Corey and I, I think I went to the Vans. I went to the Vans place. Vans gave me a bunch of shoes. I guess I gave him, I don't even remember this, but I, Corey's told me this a couple of times, but I gave him some of my shoes because I just had extras. And, uh, and then, um, and then it ended. And then they recorded their record and we went back up to the Bay Area to take a break. And we were going to start mixing at the beginning of the year. And so I came back down to do the mix. And I think it was just me that came back down. and uh, Or maybe the whole band did. I can't fucking remember now. Maybe some of us came down or part of us. I think we, we might have all come down. Because I recall like everybody kind of being there. Um, anyway, I wasn't done with the vocals. Because of my fucking rampant cocaine and alcohol <laughs> fucking mania... While in L.A. for the first session, I still had a bunch of vocals that were unfinished. Like most of the song, 80% of the song was done, but like 20% needed to be done. So I need to schedule time with 
to go back to Indigo where Ross, the producer, still was doing the Slipknot record. And so now they had finished up recording. The whole band had gone home except for Joey and Chris Fain, who is the long-nosed uh, percussionist. And uh, so it was just Ross, Chris, and Joey at that point. And I would come in. You know, they would be mixing all day, and then I would come in at night and do some vocals. And, you know, they, they was it kind of worked out perfectly because – the band, you know, they were probably burnt out and they were starting to tweak, you know, like sometimes when you're mixing, recording, like you're just, your mind starts to fucking go. And so they were like, it, the break was welcome, you know, come in, switch gears, just do some other shit. And so I would go up there and I started hearing the first couple of mixes, you know, we were listening to it in my car, like, Hey, let, let's go. You know, I had a rental car. So let's, Hey, let's check this out in your car, see how it sounds. So we'd go out and I'd hear, you know, I think one of the first songs they were doing was purity which is a song that I believe got taken off the record for a while, but maybe is, is on streaming. It's okay now. But uh, they were working on that forever. They were working on this song, and it, it's a fucking... So this is the first Slipknot song I ever hear. And and Joey's just like, what do you think, man? Like, do you think it sounds killer? Like, And I was like, fuck, it sounds... I mean, it sounds... Fu- it's a great fucking song. I fucking... To this day, I love that song. That's my. This is my introduction to Slipknot, that song. And, and, you know, keep in mind, I don't know anything about the band at this point. These are just nine dudes from Iowa. No masks, no fucking, no jumpsuit. No, like, not, like, just like, these are just nine dudes wearing, like, you know, shorts and T-shirts. And, and I'm, you know, it, in my mind, I have no, all I'm thinking is just like nine dudes in a band. Like, how are you going to split the money? <laughs> like, fucking, like, fuck, that's a lot of people. And, uh. You know, I don't realize that there's this whole imagery that goes along with it and that, you know, Clown is kind of the mastermind of that. And and, uh, and so, you know, he's just a dude and I'm just hearing it for the first time and I'm like, fuck, this shit's brutal and it's heavy and it's kind of like death metal, but it's like singing and and uh, it was just wild. And I, I didn't really hear a whole lot of the, like I didn't hear the first two or three tracks. I think they didn't, I didn't think they got to those until like, you know, halfway through the mix or near the end of the mix. And so, uh, you know, I didn't realize that it had this rap element. I just kind of heard this. And, you know, I just have, pot, like, you know, great memories of just sitting in my rental car with those guys going like, okay, like, fuck. And uh, this is cool. And I just, but I remember they worked on that one song for a really long time until they got the mix dialed in. And... And then I'd come up there on other days. I think I came up, I was coming up like every few days or something to just work on vocals. And then I'd go back and mix my record with Terry Date down in West Hollywood at Larrabee Studios. And, um, you know, I remember coming up and then we'd just have some, you know, we'd just talk after. Like I'd record my vocal sections and we'd just kind of stick around. You know, it was like 11 o'clock at night. Like there was nothing to do. You're in the fucking, Indigo Ranch is seven miles off of the main highway. It's in the middle of, fucking nowhere so there's nothing to do so we'd just watch tv sometimes and talk bullshit and you know because it was just those three you know like i i got to you know got to be pretty close with him and chris fain and uh and so i think at one point they were we were still working on our record but i think they finished their album and so they were like they had been there and i think it was you know, I can't remember how long, like I, you know, this is 22 years ago and I was pretty fucking wasted, but I want to say it took, you know, almost 30 days to mix the record, maybe less than that, but maybe three weeks, 30 days. Anyway, they were finally done. And you know, it's this bit, they're finally like, Oh my God, I just want to go fucking crazy now because, uh, I've been cooped up in fucking Indigo Ranch for 30 days, you know, seven miles from the nearest anything. And, uh, and so, so we're just, so it's just like, yeah, let's go to a strip club. Like fucking, yeah, we'll go to a strip club. We'll fucking rage. We're going to celebrate. It's the last night. They're going to fly out the next day. Like records done. Yay. Hip, hip, hooray. At this point, I still have no idea that they're like, they wear masks or anything. Like it's just like nine dudes or three dudes now. And so we go out, we go out to the strip club in LA and in, and in LA back in 1999, like not all, like if you wanted to drink alcohol, I can't remember. There was some weird fucking rule, but like. A lot of the strip clubs, like, if you wanted to drink booze, like, they the girls had to be partially covered. So they'd have, like, 
nipple tape over their nipples and they'd have like a little, you know, super small thong on. Anyway, so we go in there. We go in there. And, you know, keep in mind, Joey Jor- Jordison is, you know, maybe a a dollar twenty wet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he's a he's a little dude. He's like five three. You know, he's really skinny back then. You know, he hasn't been drinking. He's like totally great shape. And uh and so we go into the strip club and he has like maybe two or three drinks and he's fucking shit faced. <laughs> you know, he's just wasted. Chris gets wasted. Chris Fane gets wasted. It's so it's I gotta say this is one of my funnest fucking ragers at a strip club I've ever had. Chris ha- Chris Fane was so fucking funny. And he fucking gets up there. Like, the girls come out. You know, they go, we now can. Here comes Brandy to the stage. She, ladies and gentlemen, get your dollars out for Brandy. And, like, so Brandy or whoever comes out on stage. And Chris Fain, who's also now hammered, you know, after many more drinks. We're pounding him at the bar. He comes up, and now he climbs up on the fucking stage. He starts stripping with the stripper, which is the fucking Oh my God. It was one of the funniest fucking things. I was in tears watching him and Joey and I were all, you know, we're all at the table. We're all at the strip, you know, the pole, like the table around the pole and fucking Joey and I and fucking Ross are just, dude, we're crying. Like we're laughing so fucking hard that we're crying. And then of course security comes like, Hey man, you can't do that. And you know, Chris Fain just had this way of like, you know, he's, charming and you know he's got this kind of Iowa charm and he's like talks his way out of getting kicked out and like he's like oh this is joking man you know like and he was no it was obviously all for fun he wasn't being like gropey or nothing it was just like hilarious and uh and I just remember like you know I was talking and you know they were, they had just found out they got the Ozfest tour and then like I think that night I see pictures of the band for the first time like Dean Card taking photos and I was like Oh my god! I'm like, this is crazy. I was like, look at these fucking pictures of you guys. I was like, this is amazing, and uh, I was like, wow, that's gonna be really hot to play on a stage, <laughs> on stage, because now they're gonna they're about to do Ozfest as their first tour, and I was like, that's gonna be fu- it's gonna be fucking hot, dude. They're like, yeah, I know we've never done that, but anyway, just the night goes on and it's fun, and we're all just celebrating, and and uh, you know the night ends and. You know, we, they're kicking everybody out and we go outside and we're fucking, you know, I'm pretty hammered. Chris Faines is hammered and Joey you know, only had three drinks, but he's fucking shit faced. And, uh, he started, he got, we're all saying goodbye and I'm like, all right, you know, goodbye. And I'll see us. We'll see you guys. We'll cross paths. And, uh, Best of luck with the record and all this stuff. And he's like, he just starts crying. And he's like, I fucking love you, Rob Flynn. I fucking love you, man. He's just hugging me. He's hugging me for like two minutes, just crying and fucking. He's like, I'm so fucking happy with this fucking record. And and thanks for, you know, thanks for your help. And fucking, you know, like all this shit. And and, uh, it was just, I don't know. That's just a fucking, that's just a really great memory I have from that night. You know, this is. 19 this is probably march 19 february 1999 or march 1999 i've no i can't even i couldn't even tell you but uh you know then i we run into them on the tour they do ozfest second show of ozfest is in uh up here in the bay area and i mean they go up and just fucking kill it i mean it's like holy shit and uh we hang out. I th- I want to say this is uh God ninety nine. I can't remember who the headliner is. Maybe it's System of a Down or I don't. I I can't remember who's on the bill. I do remember Slipknot. I think Fear Factory was on the bill. I want to say Fear Factory was there too. And I I think I jammed with Fear Factory. I think I played Edge Crusher with Fear Factory, who were above Slipknot. I think you know Slipknot was you know brand new band. So, um. And then we do the Live in La Vida Loco tour. So then somewhere, you know, after that, it becomes apparent that, you know, it's going to be Machine Head and Coal Chamber are going to do the Live in La Vida Loco tour in the U.S. And uh, and Slipknot's going to be on the bill and then Amen. And Amen was another band that Ross had produced. So they had been hanging around the studio and we were doing the Burning Red and we got to know Casey and, you know, Dean Carr was photographed, you know, so it was just like all this kind of incestuous thing that turned out really cool. And uh, so the whole, all the bands get together for that tour. And, you know, at this point, like Slipknot's fucking hot. Like they've exploded. And I've, I've talked about this on a few other podcasts, so I don't know if I need to kind of go into this all again. But like, 
you know, they if, you know their first tour is Ozfest, big st- you know on the side stage, but still it's like a big stage, you know, tons of crew to move gear around. Now it's like, you know, th- despite the fact that you know Cold Chamber had a, almost a gold record and Machine Head had sold you know millions of records at this point worldwide, you know, the, in America this tour is still playing clubs in the Midwest. You know, in the in the big cities, we're playing bigger places, but you know, in the clubs, man, like, you, I think the tour started in Kansas. We're playing like a seven eight hundred cap room, like it's a tiny stage with a tiny, you know, and uh, so you know, it's in a in a big way, it's kind of a wake up call for Slipknot. They're like, what? There's no room. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome to real touring. You know, Ozfest is not real touring. That's like a a luxury. And, uh, so, you know, we're kind of bickering, but they're, they're, you know, they're fucking selling shit tons of records and, you know, they're a fucking, they're the hot fucking, they're killing it too. Like they're just fucking killing it in merch. Like every fucking person, I mean, every show they're fucking, they're blowing everybody off the stage. Like it's insane. And, uh, you know, we kind of, we kind of get like a, a little bit of a, you know, some, there's some tensions start brewing on there so you know I'm, I'm we're hanging out a lot with and, and granted i'm in party mode too so like fucking i'm just like fuck everybody fuck the world like i'm just getting fucked up and drinking vodka every day and doing cocaine and so uh you know at, at one point um you know chris fain and paul gray are basically they live on our bus. I mean, like we're in party rage mode. Both of those two are in party rage mode. We're just fucking. I mean, we're out of hand. Like every fucking day after. As soon as the show fucking ends, those guys come on our bus. We're fucking getting hammered, and so we're hanging out with them a lot. Joey and Clown are fucking still stone cold sober. And Corey, Corey was partying, but he wouldn't really like hang. You know, he was kind of more hanging out with fans and stuff. Um, you know, but, uh, like, so it was kind of a weird vibe, you know, like, cause two of their guys, and I think they were getting kind of mad at Chris and Paul coming over and raging so hard with us. And, uh, cause those two are still very much like, you know, they want, they were fucking hungry, man. They were young and they were hungry and they had just fucking this drive. We're like, we're not going to fucking drink. We're going to fucking kill this shit. We're going to fucking... You know, they just, they were so fucking serious. And I remember like, you know, the tensions kind of eased about a month into the tour and like we kind of got into a, a groove, you know, like it takes a while to get into a, you know, changeover and fucking and all this shit. And, um, you know, at one point then I'm just like, now I become, I get this thing in my head, like I'm determined to get Joey hammered again. Like, I'm just like, let's. Let's get like, come on, like the last night, like the fucking strip club. Let's go to the strip. And he's just, no, he just is not, he's not going to drink. He's refusing to fucking have even one beer, one brown eye. You know, he's around, he's still hanging out, but he doesn't want to fucking party. And I'm like, I don't know, you, you know, like sometimes when you're drinking, like that person that doesn't want to drink, but you know that they, like, they're not sober. They're just not drinking. Like your goal becomes, you become that annoying guy who's like, I'm going to make this guy drink, you know, like, and uh, so I became that guy. I became the annoying guy that was like, I'm going to Joey Jordison. I'm going to, which I was calling him Joey Jordanson at that point. Joey Jordanson, I'm going to make you drink. And uh, that motherfucker held his ground, man. I got to give it to him like that motherfucker. I must have fucking pe- I pestered the shit out of him for fucking probably the last three weeks of the tour. And and he didn't, you know, and then uh, we were we were getting ready to do a tour with them. It was going to be Slipknot Machine Head. Machine Head was headlining. Slipknot was going to be main support. And uh, we were getting ready to announce it. And, th- you know, their record is ex exploding everywhere i mean this it's a phenomenon like i can't that's the only way i can describe this it's a it's a fucking phenomenon and uh on the last night of the tour we're playing the chili pepper in fort lauderdale florida and i'm fucking you know it's last night of the tour i've I jumped off the fucking stage. This is when I used to do like I used to climb up on the PA and jump, do a do a stage dive into the crowd during uh, nothing left. 
And uh, so I do this. And as I do it, somebody like, you know, kind of puts their hand up in a crazy way to brace themselves from my fall. And I fucking crack a rib. And I'm like, oh, fuck. So I ended up getting, I get, I get fucking hammered after this show. I'm in tons of pain. I fucking take some pills. I do some coke. And I'm fucking, I'm kind of a wreck. The next thing I know, Joey and Sean are coming onto my bus. And I'm like, what's this? I'm like, what's all this about? You know, they hadn't been on my bus at all. They're not, you know, they hadn't partied with us. They're, you know, they, and I'm just like, this is weird. They're like, Hey, can we talk to you? And, uh, I'm like, sure. He's like, like maybe we can go in the back lounge or something. I was like, sure. Let's go in the back lounge. And so, uh, they sit, they sent me down. They're like, Hey, just want to let you know, we're bailing off the tour and we're going to do our own headline tour. And I'm like, what? And I'm kind of like, you know, I told you I'm fucking high and drunk and a mess. And, uh, and I'm like, wait, what? I'm like, dude, I'm like, that's fucked up. Like we have, you know, I kind of get pissed, but they're just like, they're both very calm and they're just like, Hey, you know, just our record's doing really good. Like we can headline, like our managers wants us to do it. We just wanted to come in and tell you personally, you know, we didn't want you to find out from the manager or find out from, you know, wherever the internet or whatever, like we just wanted to say it to you and, you know, good luck with the tour. But, you know, I can't remember what I said. I think I probably got pissed off, but, uh, you know, I would, I remember being quite pissed off, but, you know, looking back on it, I was like, I'm, I'm glad they came up to me. I'm glad they came up to me and just said it like a man, you know what I mean? Like they fucking just laid it out. And, uh, you know, you got to respect that. You don't get that a lot in the music business. Many, many other bands would have just let their managers tell my manager that they're off and, you know, fuck off. But they had enough respect for me to come up and, and say it to my face. So, you know, looking, but when I came, when I woke up and I was sober and clear headed and I looked back on it and I was like, eh, you know, we, uh, you know, fast forward you know, we do our record, we do our tour cycle, they do theirs, they become, they become a phenomenon. I mean, like, the fucking biggest, like, the biggest band in the world. It is the Beatles. I mean, it's the Beatles of that generation. Like, there's no other way to put it. You can't fathom how big this band got in such a short amount of time. It was a phenomenon. And... You know, we do that. We ended up doing this show at the end of the year, but it was about a year later. And, you know, our band has gone through a bunch of fucking ups and downs. And, or, you know, Machine Head's gone through a bunch of ups and downs. They've gone through a bunch of ups and downs. And now it's a year later in the tour cycle. And, uh, you know, now they're headlining their own festival. <laughs> like they've got a festival. Called, I forget what they're for. Is Tattoo the Earth or something, something about tattoos or something? Anyway, they're headlining over Slayer. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, this is insane. And, uh, you know, we, we end up hooking up on this festival somewhere in Wisconsin. And it's a fucking, it's a miserable day. It's fucking July or whatever. And it's pissing down rain all fucking day. It's cold. Like, it's just, it's it's miserable and you know like it's just gray and dreary everywhere and we're like fuck and uh my band was fighting a lot we were fighting about money and all this bullshit and uh and then i came in and then slipknot strolls in and i can tell there's like that they're fighting and i'm like oh shit you know and you know i remember after the show Corey went and kind of just sat in a chair like in the middle of the the catering you know this is the like you know the, all the bands are eating at this game just sits on the fucking kind of like off in the off to the center of uh and just sulks i mean like just stay it doesn't talk to anybody like i walked up to him at one point to say hey, i was like hey dude what's up and he just kind of like just continued staring at the ground and you know the vibe was definitely different i talked to joey very briefly but joey was drinking and i was like whoa and like here I am now, I'm we've traded. I'm sober now. He's drinking, and I was just like, "Oh, crazy!" I was like, "Right?" I was like, "Yeah, I gotta get out of here. I'm not gonna drink." And uh, you know, and then 
I guess the next time I saw them, you know, they were doing their second record. We were now doing our fourth record. I think we were mixing our fourth record, recording our fourth fourth record, and they were mixing Iowa. And uh, we hooked up with them, and now they're in a fan. You know, they're not. They're like, we're not recording an Indigo Ranch. Fuck that. <laughs> they're like somewhere downtown L.A. And I walk in, and it's fucking mania like like if whatever sober joey was there like it's fucking rage party boy joey like they got a bar set up in the studio like it's just fucking so out of hand and i was like holy shit and uh you know he's fucking drinking crown and fucking you know we're hanging out we're mixing there's a million people there and a million hangers on and like you know they're mixing the record like it's fucking like and they just got like a whole cavalcade of fucking people there and uh joey sits me down joey grabs he's like dude i want to play the opening track for you it's fucking sick i was just like okay and he fucking sits next to me and fucking puts me in front of the big ass fucking speakers in their super rad studio and he fucking cranks people equal shit and I was like, holy fuck, like, it's fucking, it fucking rips my face off. And, uh, you know, we end up hanging and just more drinking and more just raging. And and uh, and I was like, oh, my God, I was like, this song's going to be fucking, this, song, it, this is an anthem. This is literally a fucking anthem for the ages. Like, it's so fucking good. And, uh, you know, but we don't really kind of hang out and then... We, you know, we're much after that, why don't we don't cross paths in the tour cycle? Like our tour cycle, kind of, you know, we don't crisscross. And then, and then I didn't see him for, <clears throat> I didn't see him for a while. I had his number and I had his email, and we'd email and text every once in a while. But uh, it really wasn't until, um, it really wasn't until the the mayhem that we did with them in 2007 you know almost seven years later now that we that we now where did i run into him now you know that's not true i saw him on uh i went to the when the murder dolls came through we hung out at the murder doll show and that's where i met wednesday and i fucking love wednesday 13 because uh he had the, his fucking band the frankenstein drag queens from planet 13 or whatever the fuck <laughs> I loved the Frankenstein Drag Queens record. And so I fucking, I was like, oh, I was like, Joey's got that dude. I was like, that's amazing because I fucking love him. So I went and hung out with him. We hung out at the fucking, uh, they played Slims and uh, we hung out there. And then uh, at some point he came on, we played a show somewhere. I can't remember, but he was on the bus. It was during the Blackening tour and he came out and he hung out for a while. And, uh, but it was still, it was all kind of brief. It was very, um, you know, it wasn't really a lot. And it wasn't until 2008 when uh, when we were touring. We were touring on the Blackening, on the Mayhem Festival together. And that's when I really started reconnecting with him. And, you know, he was definitely partying then. You know, like, <laughs> he was he was partying. And, and I was too. So we'd cross paths and we'd fucking drink. And that was pretty fun. And then we ended up touring with them. We did... 80 days, we literally, this sounds crazy, but we did, we went around the world in 80 days with Slipknot. I'm not, no, like, no joke. We did uh, Japan, we did Australia, we did New Zealand, we did a really long tour of Europe, and uh, it was awesome. I mean, it was a great fucking tour, but you know, probably reconnected with them the most then. We would email a lot. I don't know why we'd email a lot. We had each other's numbers, but we would email more than anything and he loved my my ha- he loved my handle i'm not going to say what my handle is but he always <laughs> he would always call whatever my email handle was that's what he re- henceforth referred to me as he's like Ugh. and uh we hung out and man him and like by the time we got to europe man him and alexi because Ale- at children of Bodom was opening holy fuck those two were a pair like they would fucking so it was always like if i w- if we were going out it was going to be joey and Alexi, and then we'd be going to some bar to just rage. And so there was a lot of there was a lot of those nights. And I guess I guess the Roadrunner United thing. Now that I think about it, the Roadrunner United thing is before that. Yeah, I'm getting my. It's all a little cloudy, everybody. 
But uh, yeah, the Roadrunner United thing is 2006, 2005. I don't remember. Maybe came out in 2005 and the party was in 2006. Anyway, so I guess the two, so that night we hung out a lot. We hung out a lot that night because it was like a smaller vibe. There was like, you know, tons of band dudes everywhere, but, you know, we ended up hanging out the after party quite a bit. And before the show, you know, we rehearsed, we were, you know, hanging out. So that was, you know, probably that. And then, uh, and then, you know, just for a while there, I guess at the end of the tour, we texted each other. And I want to say we lost touch after that. You know, probably around 2009, 2010. We were texting until about then. And then the text would just kind of get less and less. They'd get shorter and shorter. And sometimes they wouldn't make sense. And You know, but... uh. I can't remember what happened, but I think s- something happened in my... He sent me a really nice text. I don't have it anymore. I, I, unfortunately, I've deleted... I've got a thing on my phone where it deletes a text that's over a year old. And so all my texts from us are gone. But he sent me this really... Um, this is a really sweet text. Like, really... I think somebody in my... I think somebody passed away in my life and... You know, he knew that I was upset and he sent me this really sweet text that was just super nice and meant a lot and kind of came out of the blue. Like I didn't really even expect to hear from him. You know, we probably hadn't talked for a while, but, but yeah, man, what a drummer, huh? Fucking killer drummer. I mean, he was, I remember Ross, like, pushing that dude on the drums to just do the craziest shit in the studio. And he fucking would do it, you know. He'd fucking throw shit at him, like, while he was playing. And, fucking, you know, it was like a war zone in there. And somehow it, like, made this amazing performance. It's fucking can you imagine, like, I, I can only imagine how many, uh, you know, that record's 21 years old now. Can you imagine how many kids first drummer Joey Jordanson was? I mean, Slipknot was massive. Absolutely fucking massive. The dude who, you know, Aunt, uh, Michael Lamont from Arch Enemy yesterday posted a picture of him and said, you know, the dude who brought blast beats to the masses. Yeah, totally. He's the dude who brought blast beats to the masses. You know, he did. I mean, he just, some ridiculous fucking drum performances on those fucking records, man. And uh, great songwriter. You know, I don't know how many people know this, but Joey and Paul were actually the main songwriters in Slipknot back then. Now, that dude was a fucking riff beast. So many riffs, like just riffs on riffs on riffs. I don't think he played on the records. I mean, I'm not sure. I can't remember. But uh, I want to say Mick played all of it on the records. But uh, but yeah, man. Wrote killer riffs. Great guitar player. You know, really sweet dude. Funny. You know. And God, I just I just remember those. I remember those early. Those early days, man, him just being so hungry. So, f- dude wanted it. You know, I I look back at that time and it's no surprise to me that they had the success they did. You know, he fucking wanted it. They all did. You know, and, and at that time in my life, like, I wanted it, but I was fucking up. I was fucking up. You know, and like I said earlier, you know, him kind of breaking down why he wasn't drinking and all that, like it kind of put me in check. I was just like, man, I need to, you know what? You're right. I need to fucking get my shit together here. 
And it took me a while, you know, where I was at in my life and where he was at with in his life. You know, at some point we kind of reversed roles there. He was the party boy and I was the sober one. You know, I'm not going to try and make it out like I was best friends with fucking Joey Jordison. I wasn't, you know, like I'm, you know, please don't take that away from this. You know, it's like whenever I tell dime bag stories, you know, I was, I'm not, I was not best friends with dime bag. You know what I mean? Like we lived our lives intertwined a bunch of times and, and, uh, you know, I'm just sharing stories from the things that they did, you know? I mean, probably most of our life that intertwined was the touring and then when we were recording together at the studio. But, uh, I don't know, man. Just yesterday, you know, I'd heard he was having some problems. and You know, I've got friends who still talk to him. And uh, Yesterday, I was just sad, man. I was just sad. You know, way too young. Way too fucking young. 46 years old, man. Fuck. Yeah. My friend uh, Sean Glass texted me. I've had Sean Glass on the podcast. He was the one who texted me that Joey had passed away. And I was actually doing a Twitch stream when I did it. And I was just, I just got through singing some vocals. And and I was like, holy shit. You know, just... It was sad, man. It's a shame. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to pay a little bit of a tribute to him today. You know, remembering my memories of him. You know, and again, for anybody who's listening, I'm not trying to make it look like Joey Jordison and I were fucking besties. We weren't. The man. Wrote some fucking great songs. Played some fucking awesome drums. And, uh, man, you made your mark on the world, bro. You made your mark on the fucking world. Seriously. Made a mark on my life. Made a mark on so many people's lives. So, rest in peace, brother. <laughs>